Today we're continuing on with our series on the parables, and today we're going to cover the parable of the mustard seed and leaven. If we could stand for the reading of God's word, hallelujah, in honor of his holy infallible word, that's what we'll be today. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air cometh and lodge in the branches thereof. Hmm. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like uh, have the kingdom is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spoke he them not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was written by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept in secret from the foundations of the world. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this time that you've given us together. Lord, I pray for every man that has come in this place today, Lord. Lord, if, that they, if they are thirsty, Lord God, that they would come to the well of living water, which is you, Lord, and it would be greatly provided to you out of the abundance of your love. I just ask you, Lord God, that you would reconcile families. And I ask you, Holy Spirit of God, that you move to the pews of this chapel, that you would have your way with every heart, including this preacher. Let nothing I say be me, but let it all be of you, Lord. And I pray a special blessing for every man that has come today in your holy name. And every man said, Amen. Continuing on with the parables, Jesus got done speaking of one parable, and then he goes into another parable of the sower, and then he goes into another parable of the wheat and tares, but smack dab in the middle of these two parables is these two parables that we're reading today. And you say, well, what are they doing in the middle of two longer parables? Why are they placed here? And, and I believe I can answer that for you as best as I know how. But the Lord spoke in parables, and it was alluded to here again in verse 35. And a parable is just a heavenly concept that he used, that he brought to realization just by normal earthly terms so that you and I could get it. And what's fascinating about parallels, if you're saved and you know Jesus Christ, you'll get the parable. That, that's the gist of, of 35. If you're saved, you know Jesus Christ, you'll get the parables. But if you don't know Christ, the parables will be like, I'm scratching my head, I don't get it. I don't understand why these parables are, why he's talking like this. And so it was meant on purpose for the parallels, for those that knew Christ, that they would get it. And for those that didn't know Christ, it was meant on purpose that they wouldn't get it. And so that there would be a hunger there to come to Christ, know who he was, and then know the parables. It says in verse 35 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets saying, I will open my mouth in parables. And that was spoken by Asaph in Psalm 78 and 2. He was a prophet of sorts, but he was a seer. And, and I have preached on, on him before. And it says that I will open my mouth in, parab in a parable and I will utter dark sayings of old. And that's the words of Asaph from Psalm 78 and 2, now being fulfilled as Jesus is speaking in the exact parables that this man is talking about. So when we're talking of the parable of the mustard seed and leaven, the best way to interpret what God is trying to get to us to say, or try to say to us, is let the Bible interpret itself. If you let the Bible interpret itself and you are a reader of the word of God, you'll get it. And you can make the connections. You know, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Speaking of Jesus Christ, He is the Word. 
And he indeed comes to us in these parables, in these sayings, to explain to us what they mean. Now, we reference the mustard seed. Everyone knows that if you have the grain, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to these mountains, be moved and be cast into the sea, and they would go. And so in that regard, it's spoken of as in a positive term. But a mustard seed, as it is with the leavened bread, are speaking of the same thing, really. The mustard seed is small, it starts out small, but like Jesus had said in our text today, it's the least of all seeds, but when it grows, it comes up to be this large herb, a tree. And the same thing is the same with the leavened bread. Uh, we don't use the word leaven here in the United States in America, we use the word yeast. So if you don't mind, I'm going to substitute leaven and yeast because that's how we know what leaven is here. But that's what leaven is in the, in the Middle East and, and back in the time when this was written, it was called leaven. Leaven was yeast. And so it said to, the, said to them, another parable he spoke and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took. Now I'm going to tell you who the woman is and describe to you what that, who that is and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. Now, uh, yeast, uh, if any of you guys have baked at all and worked in a bakery or just baked at home, you know that you start out with just a little bit of yeast, a couple tea teaspoons or tablespoons, depending on how much you're making. You dissolve it in some really warm water, 100 degree water, and you mix it in with your flour and voila, whatever you got just blooms. And thankfully here in Milwaukee, we've got one of the best yeast uh, companies in the whole wide world. So uh, thankful for that. But they're saying the same thing, that what the Lord is trying to say is the same thing, that the yeast starts out small, you get a little bit of it, but when you put it into the dough and you mix it with flour, it becomes big, just like the mustard seed. And what is he referring to? He's referring to the church because he's talking about the kingdom of God. And so when he talks about the kingdom of God, He's talking about leaven. Well, what, it, what is leaven and what does that represent in the Bible? In Leviticus 2 and 11, it says, as far as the Levitical law, it says, No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. For ye shall be, burn no leaven, nor any honey, any offering of the Lord made by fire. So leaven is a reference to sin, and it's a reference to a negative connotation uh, of sin that you don't come to the Lord with it, and you don't put it in the proper ways with the sacrifices out to the Lord, but you do without it. The Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the unleavened of Israel, which is a fantastic statement because it says that he is without sin. Unleavened means without and so unleavened means it doesn't it has there's no there's no leaven in it so no yeast no sin and so that's what Jesus is referred to in Leviticus 2 and 11 they're saying that whenever you bring something to the Lord a sacrifice sin can't be in the presence of the Lord bring unleavened bread but don't bring leavened bread we don't want nothing to do with it but the apostle Paul talks about it in the same terms in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, because the Corinthian church was once on fire for Christ. They loved him, but they slowly allowed false preachers to come in. They turned on themselves. Everybody became more popular than everybody else. It came to be like a talent show or a battle of wits, a battle of minds. And uh, they were out of control. They were out of control. And so... The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, Your glorifying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Don't you know that a little sin, when it enters the church, causes a big trouble? Because it spreads like wildfire. You allow sin into the church, and you allow people to have their sin and to enjoy it. People feed off of it. Next thing you know, you got this whole bloom where the whole church is doing it. You have to be very careful. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, which is sin, 
that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, means that you're sinless, covered under the blood of Christ. Since Christ is our Passover, sacrifice for us. We don't need to go back to that life of sin. It says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, he's saying, don't come to church with sin and let it spread and let it fumigate throughout the, throughout the church, but come with sincerity and truth and let that permeate throughout the church and let everybody be happy and content with that. So in both of these, it starts out with the church because the kingdom of God is the church age. It started on the day of Pentecost and it'll be all the way through the second coming of Christ. And so what the Lord is saying is that the church will start out small also. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people gave their life to the Lord. Another 5,000 people gave their life to the Lord. But then you look at today and where the church is today and how many people are claiming that they're a Christian. And there's a lot of people that are claiming that. And so he's saying that the church will start out small, but it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But with that church becoming bigger and bigger and bigger comes more responsibility, comes more issues, comes more problems. And your love for God has become strong. Amen. I haven't got that far yet, brother, but you're on the right track. You're on the right track. And so he's talking about false preachers coming in from within. And he's talking from about Satan that will do all he can to spread trouble into the church from without. And so the church and the kingdom of God will always have two of these two, para, these two uh, problems or issues. They'll have Satan that will do everything he can to wipe out the church. And then you will also have trouble within the church understanding and realizing that they need to stay in the word and they need to stay at a fresh course with Christ. And the problem is that even when you look at today, there are so many false Christs out there already. There's false preachers out there by the score. And if you don't know your Bible, you're going to get burned by them because they are able to eloquently twist the word of God to make it sound the way they want it to sound but in a way that if you don't know your Bible, you're going to say, you know what, that sounds wonderful. And so my, one of my other key things that I'm trying to impress on you today is you got to stay in the Word and you got to continue to read the Word because if you don't, these false prophets will come in, these false preachers will come in, they'll say this, they'll say that, and you'll say, oh, that sounds wonderful, but it's not in the Word of God, Amen. And so we need to stay on task. Jeremiah had to deal with false preachers back even in his day. In, Je in Jeremiah 8 and 10, it says, Therefore I give you wives unto others, and the fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one of the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covetousness. From the prophet, even unto the priest, every day, everyone deals falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they, were they ashamed when they have made, committed this abomination? Nay, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall into the time of their visitation. And back in Jeremiah again in 29 and 8, it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to, the, to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. The Lord says they, they are going to come and they are going to proclaim what they want to proclaim. 
And they're going to say, the Lord has sent me to you. The Lord has given me a Rama, Rama word for you. The, word, the, the Lord has given me this revelation for you. And the Lord is standing in heaven and he's saying, I never gave that to you to tell the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. I never told you to preach that message to the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. I never gave you these things to be able to say to these people. And that's what people do. And, and, and Jesus said in the last days, he said this in Matthew 24, 3, speaking at the end of the church age, when a lot of this stuff is going to transpire to a greater degree, he says, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us what all these things shall be and what shall be the sign of thy coming at the end of the world. And so they're asking Jesus, when you come back, how are we going to know? And he says that Jesus answered them and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. That's the words of Jesus himself. He says that in the end times it will be so many people that will be such a false deception that's brought on by the devil himself as he's got his own set of preachers that will come into the world and try to deceive you into thinking that there's another gospel we call it a pseudo gospel a social gospel but it ain't no gospel of God he'll try to trick you he'll try to throw you under the bus and he'll try to get you to believe something that ain't true and again, I go back to my point that if we're in the word of God, we're loving the Lord Jesus Christ, just spot them out a mile away. Because, you know, like if you work at a bank and they train you on how to know when a false 50 or a, a, a false $100 bill comes in, they train you by having you feel real money. When you feel the real money, you'll know when the false comes in, it works the same way with the Bible. I, I can't talk about that right now. And so, the Apostle Paul says this in Galatians in chapter 4. He's talking in Galatians 4, and he says this. They were once on fire for Christ. They loved the Lord. But they allowed these false preachers to come in, and they, they gotten away from the real gospel. And he says this. He says in verse 6, he says, I marvel how you are so soon to be removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel of heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let them be accursed. As we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you, then you have received, you have received, let him be accursed. Because they will come in and they will proclaim the word of God. They will come in and they'll say wonderful things. They will say things to you that will tickle your ears and get you all excited about the things of God and the things of heaven. But in it all, it isn't the true gospel. It isn't the true word of God, but it is a false God. And this comes up, and it, it happens in churches all the time. And there are full-blown ministries in the last days as times get harder and harder and harder, where people will not endure the, the word of God they will not endure what the word of God says. And they'll fall for these preachers. And, and the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3, uh, in chapter 3. Now, I'm going to read this list. Now, you tell me if you think that today, as we are standing here and sitting here in the Milwaukee Rescue Commission, tell me if you think that, that this is getting more and more and more prevalent in your life. Yeah. Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. 
And, and that word perilous means that there'll be a cutting away, there'll be a cutting away. And, and it says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incoherent, fierce, despisers of that which is good, traitors, high handy, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Does that sound like today at all to you? It sounds like it's getting more and more and more and more to this, what the Apostle Paul is speaking. But I believe that we're in for uh, more harder times yet. But if you are secure in Christ and you know him as your Lord and Savior, it don't matter what happens out there. Really, it don't matter what happens outside these walls because you've got Christ. Your sin debt's been forgiven. He'll protect you. I just don't worry about stuff because I just know my God will take care of all my needs. But now, who is the woman with the three measure of flowers? The woman that's talked about with the three measure of flowers is the, is the harlot church, the false church that's spoken about in the book of Revelation. We call it eschatology for talking about the future, but a future time in the book of Revelation, there will be a harlot church that will take up residency in the world. Many, many, many will be in this harlot church. And it says, There came unto one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked to me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto you a judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the king of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitation of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit unto the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having the seven heads and heaven horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a gold cup in her hand, full of the abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots, an abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great adoration. It's the harlot church. There will be this church in the last days that the devil will have for himself. And this is the woman that we're speaking of in the parable that Jesus gave. The conclusion is this, is like my brother had said, stay in your relationship with Christ. Stay looking and focused on the Lord. Don't stay focused and looking out to the new and what's new and fangled in the church world, but keep your eyes on the prize of Jesus Christ. Don't move to the left, don't move to the right, don't get all excited because this is coming across or that's coming across. It may be of God, but then again, it may not be. But if you're strong and you know the word of God and you know what God has offered you by eternal life and the forgiveness of sins, you can stay in this world, you can stay as long as you have to, and be confident that by reading the Word of God, staying in the Word of God, that you'll be able to make it all the way to the end. And that's what Jesus had said in the end of, of his statement when he was going through the things that he was talking about. He said in verse 13 of chapter 24 of Matthew, but he shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. And I marvel because we support a missionary uh, that is in Uganda, that is in the Sudan, and they have 
uh, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they had like a, a Range Rover that they had put a, a microphone and a speaker system set up, and they were broadcasting the Bible uh, and the, the gospel everywhere they could. And then they have these, stru- these new towers uh, that I heard on, on one of the radio, Christian radio stations, big, strong towers. They're able to radio in the gospel into communist countries, in the, into dictatorship countries, that people that have never heard the gospel would be able to hear the word of God in the greater proportions. And the Lord said that all those things will happen and then he will return. And praise God that there are people out there yet to hear the gospel and that will come to a saving knowledge of Christ and don't know him yet. And as I close today, my question is for you. When Jesus returns or when you die, will you know him and know him as your Lord and Savior? Can you be assured that if you're not raptured out of here, that you will, you will know him or not know him? The decision is for you, gentlemen, today, as we're at the 445, either you know him or you don't. You were, if you were to spend eternity today would be the last day of your life, would you know where you're going to spend it? Would it be with Christ? Have you asked Jesus into your heart? Do you know him? And so as I close, my question to you is this. Do you know him? Is your sin debt forgiven? And if you do know him, how much time do you spend reading the word of God? How much time do you spend knowing the Lord and knowing him? The Rama word as it comes to us, the the word of God as it's presented, the love letter that Christ has given to you and I, that we could know him and know him in in the intimacy of life. Do you know him that way? When the false preachers come and the the false church comes and the, the later times when things get harder and harder and harder, are you going to be stay focused on the Lord? Are you stay focused in the hands of the Lord as he keeps his saints in the hands of the Lord? Are you going to be content with that? Are you going to be there? Or are you going to be swept away when all these newfangled things take place in life? And trust me, they're out there already and they, they grab for your attention just like everything else. But let's bow our heads and pray. As we bow our heads and pray, I want to ask you a couple things. The first one is apparent. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know that if you were to die today, that you would have eternal eternity with Christ? Or are you guessing that you may or may not have it? The Bible says today from 1 John 1 and 9, you can know for sure that you're saved. You can know today that you're a child of God. And the second question I want to ask you is this. If you are not saved, you don't know Christ, are you willing to raise a hand today and say, today I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? With heads bowed, eyes closed, would anybody willing to raise a hand today and say, today I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. I see your hands. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus in the fullness of his word. I want his name. I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm going to lead you to what we call through a sinner's prayer. You repeat after me. It doesn't have to be loud, but internalize it into your own heart if you want to. But if the Bible says, if you pray from the depth of your heart, in humility, you're saved. You'll know Jesus Christ. God makes the Bible simple. God makes knowing him simple. It's not complicated. And then I'm going to pray for the rest. Heavenly Father, knowing that I'm a sinner and that you died for sinners, I receive you today as my Lord and my Savior. Cast my sins as far as east as west, never to return no more. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
and lead me into all holiness. Give me a hunger and an appetite to read the word of God, to know you. Holy Spirit, come to live within me this day. Amen. And I pray for the rest of my brothers here, Lord God, I pray. Lord, that you would help those that know you as Lord and Savior to stay on task. Stay focused on the Word. Stay focused on their relationship with you, that they would continue to grow and have deep roots. Lord, I pray for wisdom and discernment for those that know you as Lord and Savior, that they would not fall for the trickery of the devil, and that they would not fall for the evil that comes from within. And I pray, Lord God, for those men that don't know you today yet. I pray, Father, your love and your grace, the living water would be poured upon them through this vessel today, that they would be swept away into the kingdom of God from where they are now, Lord. And I pray that you do a marvelous work in their lives. Restore relationships, restore, Lord God, children with their parents, husbands and wives together, Lord God. Pray if any man needs prayer that they could come up to me later, 